So Sasha Abramsky is joining us today, a freelance journalist, and you teach journalism at UC Davis. You are um, the writer of Signal Noise, the column that appears twice weekly for The Nation magazine. Uh, Sasha also writes a regular column for Truth Out. Your writings have appeared over the years in Atlantic, New Yorker, New York Times, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, American Prospect, Mother Jones, and all the good places to get real news. <laughs> appreciate your work. Um, so the Senate finally came to a compromise on the economic stimulus bill. There seems to be some hope that political leaders across the country are stepping up to the plate to do what's right for the American people. Uh, and Sasha Abramsky is here to talk about that. In your recent piece, piece for Truth Out, you wrote, it's clear that the U.S. social con compact is at the back end of the crisis, will look dramatically different from how it you know, looks going in. Can you talk about uh, what you mean and if you believe there's any hope for our social compact? Because yeah, No, that's a good question. Um, what, what I mean is I, I've been writing about social justice themes for all of my career. So for 25 years, I've been writing on poverty, criminal justice, how we treat immigrants, um, environmental justice, and so on. And one of the things that I've written about is the fact that for various reasons, the way we treat people at the bottom of the economy is dramatically different from the way that many other wealthy democracies treat poor people. We make it harder to access unemployment insurance. We make it harder to access health care. We make it harder to access paid sick leave. Um, we have a whole bunch of things that work for people at the top of the economy. But what the consequences of that is that people at the bottom, many, many tens of millions of families, are one paycheck away from disaster. They just have absolutely no safety net to fall back on. And so when the pandemic hit, we suddenly found well, we're in this insane situation where we're trying to control a contagious disease where we have tens of millions of people with no access to health care, no access to primary care doctors who until they get desperately ill and then go to emergency rooms for treatment. So we know that there's that hole. We know that Trump in particular has gone out of his way to push immigrants, legal and illegal, out of the safety net. So with the new public charge rules, there's been this massive push to make it almost impossible for immigrant families to access Medicaid, to access nutritional assistance programs and so on. Um, so we have all these holes in the system. And then when a pandemic, pandemic hits and we find that A, the only way to control it is very, very good proactive medical care, and B, that we're gonna have to have these shutdowns, these rolling shutdowns that hit cities, that hit states, in many places have been hitting entire countries. If you look at Italy, if you look at Spain, if you look at what India's now done. And it's extremely difficult to contain not only the health damage, but also the cascading economic damage if you have a vulnerable safety net system, if you have a safety net system that excludes millions of people. So that's what I was writing about in that article. Sasha, what do you, what, uh, there's, there's two lines of questioning I have here and I'll let you choose which way you want to go. Is the, uh, you know, the assumption is that the reason that we have these kind of laws here is because of like vulture capitalism and the, the you know, basically this, this argument that we have to be, uh, we have to have austerity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the second question is, it's been a week or more, depending on where you live, if people don't have a job and if they've been cut off and they don't have any social safety net, are we already seeing, um, you know, people, where's the bread line? Are we already seeing people trying to get into it? Can you give us an idea of what's happening? Uh, uh, the second question first, I mean, the, the answer is I don't know because like everybody else, I'm largely staying at home. Um, I do know because I'm in contact with people who work on the front lines at food banks. I'm in contact with people who work on the front lines with legal assistance and so on. There's an awful lot of people out there who have lost everything. People who live paycheck to paycheck. They were working in restaurants. They were working in bars. They were working jobs that overnight disappeared. And, you know, we're in this situation where, you know, a month ago, whatever one thought of Donald Trump, and if you read my writings, you know, I don't think much of Donald Trump. But whatever no, one neither do we. <laughs> you know, the economy was doing okay by many, many measures. It was doing very well a, a month ago. It was unequal. The, the benefits were unfairly distributed, but it was roaring along. So we're in this sort of historic, unprecedented situation where we were going at full speed and suddenly a health crisis mandates basically a complete economic shutdown of non-vital services. Mm. And so you're going from 3% or 3.5% unemployment 
to double digit unemployment. And, you know, we don't know how double digit, we don't know if it's 10% or 20 or even 30, but we know it's gonna be depression era levels of unemployment. And so of course, we're seeing people who are desperately worried about how they're gonna pay their bills, desperately worried about how they're gonna feed their kids, desperately worried about how they're going to do all the things they need to do on a daily basis to stay afloat. Now, you know, the good news, and there is some good news, in this moment, cities, states, and the dysfunctional federal government are beginning to step up. So cities have started banning evictions. Um, state governments have started stepping in to try and backstop uh, mortgage, you know, make sure that people aren't um, foreclosed on if they can't pay their mortgages. And yesterday, finally, the Senate seems to have come to a $2 trillion agreement some of which may be a boondoggle to big business, but a lot of which is going to channel money towards unemployed workers. Mm -hmm. So Charles Schumer called it unemployment insurance on steroids. What it basically is going to do is expand the length of time you can be on insurance, but as importantly, the value. Mm -hmm. And that's moving toward what's done in England, what's been done in Denmark, where the government basically said, we're going to backstop wages. So in England, they said up to a certain annual salary value, the government will basically pay for the next few months 80% of wages to keep people employed. Denmark said, well, we'll do you one better. We'll pay up to 90% of hourly wages for self-employed workers. So there are these, you know, wealthy countries have these options to try and cushion the pain. It took America a long time to get on board with this, partly because of political strife in DC, partly because the federal administration, until very, very late in the day, tried to downplay the problem. It didn't want to have a big problem because that would look bad economically. It might hurt Trump's re-election prospects. So you had this crazy situation where states were shutting down. I live in California. We went in to stay in place nearly two weeks ago. States were shutting down, but the federal government was basically saying, go on with your lives as normal. And it's only once the federal government realized that's not going to play, that it just would be too catastrophic healthcare-wise, only then did we see this move at the federal level to basically put government in play to try and cushion the blow. Now, you know, there is, there, there is I don't, the, the word silver lining is clearly wrong, but there is something positive that might come out of this, which is at the back end of this crisis, we're going to see the importance of things like universal health care, you know, partly out of altruism, but also out of self-interest. We're going to realize as a society, we do better when we can monitor people's health and check epidemic diseases before they escalate. So even if Bernie Sanders is kept out of uh, winning the Democratic nomination, um, we might still get Medicare for all, is what you're saying? You know, I, I went to a dinner party. It was the last dinner gathering I went to before we went in to stay in place. I, I was just about to ask what date. I, <laughs> I, 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 I made a little bet with a few friends of mine. And I said, I think before this is over, the Republicans are going to pass something equivalent to Medicare for all. Not because the Republicans have suddenly become democratic socialists and suddenly embrace Bernie Sanders' ideas, but because they're going to realize it's going to be completely impossible to go into an election as the party that opposes healthcare access during a pandemic. So if you're Mitch McConnell and you're thinking strategically, you don't want the Democrats to be in charge of that. You don't want the Democrats to be able to wrap their arms around it and say, this is our big idea. You want the Republicans to say, hey, we're the party that curbed a pandemic by expanding access to health care. So it's entirely possible that Bernie Sanders, you know, he's not going to be the nominee. That's clear now. But it's entirely possible that many of the ideas that Bernie Sanders has been championing for years and years and years in this crisis are suddenly going to become somewhat mainstream. And as a, as a uh, media professional myself, I do believe that Bernie Sanders just being out there running for president uh, twice and having the messages that he's been giving uh, out there have kind of primed the country to want Medicare for all and not just settle for some public private. No, I mean, ab measure. absolutely. I mean, all the opinion poll data showed that there were significant parts of the voting population moving towards acceptance of Medicare for all over the last year or two. And it wasn't just Medicare for all. Things that several years ago were sort of outliers on the left had been mainstream. The $15 an hour minimum wage, for example, paid sick leave. Um, there were a whole bunch of social justice, economic justice reforms that had become part of the ma mainstream political debate even before this crisis. 
Now, if you now assume this crisis is going to roll through for the next six months, maybe a year, or whenever the vaccine becomes widely available, maybe 18 months, this is going to change our lives fundamentally, you know, through 2020, certainly, but quite likely into 2021. Over that period of time, we're going to have a tremendous rethink of what politics is. And, you know, it can go in two directions. On the one hand, if we stay alert, if we stay in some form of solidarity, even in lockdown, it could result in progressive political change. The danger, of course, is it goes in the other direction and you get this increasingly authoritarian, xenophobic, militarized, surveillance-based backlash. And you've seen that in a lot of countries, that one of the responses is that people increasingly go down this route where they say we have to survey everyone and everything. We have to make sure that we monitor every aspect of people's lives, otherwise the virus bounces back. So there's clearly a danger. You know, there's clearly a danger that in this moment, democracy completely under threat, that you, you sort of see it as a cover for um, a very reactive politics. And that's what we have to fight against, however we can in our stay at home moment. If there is a political outcome of, say, the Republicans passing a Medicare for all bill, which I'm assuming wouldn't just be like, end forever, they would say Medicare for all until 2021 when everyone's fine and then it's back to, uh, you know, <laughs> private health care as normal. Uh, do you see a, a, um, a devolution of the two party system if because uh, many on the right believe that the people on the left are the ones who are going to be more authoritarian. And in some areas, they actually have a point um, in terms of curbing free speech, that kind of thing. How, how do we remain, you know, uh, on two sides? Uh, if no, I, I, That's a good idea. But you see where I'm getting with this uh, muddled I question. I, I think. I, I think that in moments of extreme crisis, whether it's wars, whether it's public health epidemics, whatever, in, in moments where life as we know it ceases to exist, everything gets thrown up in the air. You, you saw it during the World War I period that the politics that emerged after World War I, whether it was the revolution in Russia or whether it was the expansion of democracy in the franchise in Western Europe, that old worlds and old orders broke down profoundly. You saw it during the Great Depression, that things that were simply impossible politically in America became mainstreamed, social security being the case in point. That there, there are these sort of moments in world history where because everything becomes so chaotic, politics as usual ceases to exist. And you know, again, it goes in two directions. It goes either in a very progressive direction or a very reactionary coercive direction. But we're in one of those moments, the, the idea that after COVID-19, the world is gonna look like it did before COVID-19 just doesn't make sense. It's, it's changed the way we understand international relations. It's gonna change the way we understand trade and national security. It's certainly gonna change the way we travel. The, you know, we're living in a pipe dream if we think that two or three years from now, we're gonna be traveling as easily and as cheaply as we did in 2018 or 2019. It's not, we're gonna have all kinds of disruptions. But in that moment, new political alliances tend to emerge. So when you say, you know, will the two party system survive? I don't know if it will or not, but I suspect that there will be new alliances and there'll be strange alliances. You'll have, you know, weird allies on the left and right coming together around things like access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, things that seemed very, very important politically a year or two ago will seem trivial in 2021. And the reverse also holds. Things that we weren't talking about in 2018 or 2019 will become politically center stage after the epidemic. So I do think, you know, thinking long term, we're probably in for a few years of really, really interesting and probably quite confusing politics here. We're talking with Sasha Abramsky, journalist, author, professor, and creator of the Abramsky Report. Uh, Sasha, uh, we have some comments coming in. Mr. Decrypting on our Twitch cast uh, says that a country like Italy has the Servicio Sanita Sanitario Nacionale, which is basically a universal healthcare system, uh, I be he believes, and it is in a terrible state at the moment with the virus. Can you talk about how um, that, you know, the, the mechanism of, of that and um, when people make the I think the comment is based at like, well, if we have Medicare, why would Medicare for all be something that we would do here in the United States if you can just point to Italy and say, even though they had Medicare for all, they became the epicenter of-, of I, 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 I think that if you look at what happened in Italy, 
they're in a terrible crisis despite the fact they have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, not because of it. It would be infinitely worse if they didn't have a universal system and you had 10% or 15% of the population with no access to easy healthcare. Um, they're in a crisis because their system's overwhelmed because there's so many people falling desperately ill and they don't have enough equipment. And if anybody is looking at what's happening in New York City at the moment, or what's happening in parts of California. I'm looking at it from my no, window. <laughs> of course. I mean, you know, here, here's, here's the thing. I mean, it's abundantly clear that America is in the next few weeks going to be in, if not the same situation, a not terribly different situation than Italy and Spain are in today. They have fabulous healthcare systems. They have highly trained doctors. They have good hospitals and they're still overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the idea that a universal system somehow weakens a public health response, I don't think any public health expert in the world would agree with that. If, if you have an epidemic disease which spreads, especially amongst asymptomatic people, the only way you can rein that epidemic disease in is aggressive testing. Mm -hmm. and the only way you can do aggressive widespread testing is if people have easy access to medical coverage. There's just no way around that. And that transcends ideology. And that, again, you know, coming back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, one of the reasons I think it's going to lead to strange new political alliances around issues like universal health care is even ideological Republicans tend to be pragmatic when it comes to health. Nobody really wants a raging, untreatable epidemic unity. Well, this, this all uh, relies on the fact that we still have uh, some shards of uh, democracy left, correct? If uh, Republicans are concerned about being reelected, then maybe they will do something like putting in a Medicare for all if they are un unconcerned about that due to any number of things that have been put uh, put out, you know, concerning Trump trying to suspend elections in whatever way, uh, they, then we would have authoritarianism. And but that- even, you know, uh, even in authoritarianism, and I, I, I mean, I was listening to Trump yesterday and he was, you know, talking this absolute nonsense about opening the country up for business again in April. Uh. And you know, somebody I know phoned me in tears afterwards and said that, you know, basically what he's doing is he's condemning millions of people to death if he does that. Now, you know, that's true. If you if you prematurely take the foot off the brakes and you say, all right, everybody socialize again, everybody go into large crowds again, everybody go to Trump rallies again, which I suspect was at the back of Trump's mind. If you do all of that, you know, <laughs> just your for his own rallies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, if, if you do all of that. Yes, it's authoritarian, but it's also desperately dangerous. And whether or not you live in a democracy or whether or not you live in an authoritarian regime, at the end of the day, I don't think anybody wants mass casualty like that. It doesn't, you know, it, in the most crass way possible, it doesn't do anyone any good. You know, if Trump thinks, well, I can get reelected by opening the economy up early, it doesn't matter how authoritarian he is, he's not going to get reelected if he does something which completely flies in the face of public health and leads to mass casualties. He'll be Carol, vilified. Carol Four asks, um, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, she makes a comment, I'm assuming it's a she, uh, makes a comment that Michael Moore is suggesting in his fireside chats that um, why are we not seeing, you know, every dem dem everyone's at home watching, what do we do here? People are watching this, how do we, uh, where do we go from here as a populace? How do we, you know, what do we do as a you person know, to make sure that we don't let the Republicans run roughshod over a populist okay. agenda? Carol, your question's great because there's a real, real problem here, which is that in the, under the umbrella of fear, when we're all staying at home, we're all terrified, under the umbrella of fear, authoritarian governments all over the world are doing really bad things. You saw it in Israel where Netanyahu's allies basically closed down parliament. It was, a, it was an extraordinary power grab. And we've seen it here where some just awful things are going on under cover of COVID-19. So the Department of Justice asked Congress last week, and Congress hasn't said yes, but the Department of Justice last week basically asked Congress to suspend habeas corpus and allow for indefinite detention. Yes. Um, they, the, the, the administration shut down all asylum admissions and all refugee admissions during this crisis. 
Now, again, they've said maybe it's temporary, but what they've basically done is used it as a cover for Steve long goal of shutting down the border and simply throwing back anyone who comes over back into Mexico with no due process. And that's extraordinary. In, and it's going on now on a daily basis. Um, we had 3,000 doctors last week publicly urge ICE to release inmates. Mm. And instead, ICE has kept them ever more tightly compacted, ever more tightly imprisoned, and people are going to die because of that. So we are seeing terrible things done under cover of this. The, the one that just drove me mad yesterday was when Ohio and Texas decided that they were going to ban abortions during the crisis because these were elective surgeries that could be delayed. Now, of course, you can't delay an abortion. Yes, I mean, that makes no sense at that. all. Yeah. <laughs> but it's you know, being yeah. used by religious right organizations and religious right politicians as an excuse to lock down abortion access. So there are all kinds of awful things happening. What do we do about it, Carol asked? Well, at the moment, we pay attention because we can't flood the streets in protest at the moment. It would be you know, public health calamity. We can't go out en masse and picket, uh, picket Congress or picket state government offices, but we have to pay attention and we have to manage. What, one of the things I do in my signal noise column is I say, this is what we need to be paying attention to, even though it's easy to, to get distracted. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in a crisis like this is we're all scared, everybody's scared, but we have to maintain our critical faculties and we have to work out, you know, here's what's reasonable as a public health response, and here's what's an unreasonable thing that's being done under cover of an epidemic. What do you think about the economic stimulus that was passed yesterday? Well, I have to admit, I live in California, so it's fiendishly early in the morning. Oh, I apologize, and I thank you very much for being up at this okay. ungodly hour. Uh, you know, at least browse the headlines and see what it says. But I think a lot of it, it's a lot better than it was a few days ago. And I'm really, really glad that the Democrats push back against the initial Republican plans because this new one has far more oversight of the money that's going to be channeled to businesses. It prohibits them using it for stock buybacks and all kinds of things. And it's got a lot more worker protections, um, especially around unemployment insurance. So I looked at it. I don't know if it's the best bill possible. I doubt it is. But it seems to me that it's actually got a lot of good components. And if the money starts flowing fast, and you know, that's a big if because we're dealing with bureaucracies that are overwhelmed with application. But if the money starts flowing fast, it will do an awful lot of good to mitigate the pain. It won't end the pain. I mean, there's going to be an awful lot of people excluded from it. Undocumented immigrants, for example, are going to be completely hammered because they're in low income hourly wages. They have no access to any of these benefits. But it is a far better package than the one that we were seeing floating around last week or even at the beginning of this week. So I guess on balance, I'd say it's a, you know, a fairly decent piece of legislation. Now the money needs to be distributed. Um, it's a question here. Can you ask your guest uh, from Mr. Decrypting, why does he think that Germany with its Oh my, and it, I can't read that word. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna have to skip that question. Um, Professor Abramsky, if you want to support activists and leaders who are pushing toward bailing out workers and families over corporations and billionaires in this moment, who should we look toward? I, I think all the, you know, all the usual suspect, suspects, groups like civil rights organizations, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, a lot of the legal clinics that are working with DACA recipients and working with immigrants of whom still have to deal with their law cases throughout this crisis, uh, food banks, which are desperately trying to maintain access to food supplies, um, groups that are working with the homeless. And again, you've seen some states like California has actually put in a lot of energy in the last few weeks to try and move homeless people off the streets and into shelters and into trailers and into hotels that they've rented. Um, but there are all kinds of vulnerable groups out there that are no less vulnerable today than they were yesterday. And there are- Why Sorry, I was just going to say there are all kinds of groups that are still trying. I mean, it's really, really difficult because everyone's staying at home. But we've sort of migrated the activism online to meetings like this. You know, we're having Zoom meetings. We're doing all the things we used to do face to face. They're still going on. They're just going on in new ways. But um, I think, you know, all those groups should be supported. Uh, other, oh, thank you so much for staying with us. I really appreciate this. We've got a lot of questions coming I'm, in and I'm, I have my own personal questions. Um, the question is, why do you think that Germany, with its national health care and private health insurance, is doing so well, apparently, as far as the death rates appear with the virus? What are they doing so differently? Is it a misreporting of death tolls? 
Uh, is it too early in the lifespan of the German ep epidemic to see accurate numbers? Um, it, this is the same question as before that uh, he reworded uh, you know, to I, take out all the German I, words, which I appreciate. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to cop out a little bit here because I'm not a doctor, I'm not a public health specialist, and I don't want to. I don't want to hypothesize too much. So I'll, I'll just say a few things I've read because I have been reading a lot about this because it's fascinated me. Um, one of the things I read yesterday, because public health experts in Europe are trying to figure this out because it's the same strain of the virus that's circulating in Italy, but Italy's got a much higher death rate. So one of the theories I read yesterday was that Germans Germany, don't touch each other. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, there are all kinds of theories. One theory is that, you know, Southern Europeans tend to kiss and hug much more and Northern Europeans less. Um, but, but two other theories I've read. One is that Germany very, very early on started comprehensive methodology. So they were testing asymptomatic people to try and see the extent of community spread. So from very early in the epidemic, Germany was catching minor cases of the disease that many countries were missing. Mm. So one theory is that Germany actually has a sort of truer estimate of the mortality rate because it's factoring in the less seriously ill patients. But the other estimate I read is that in the hospitals itself, they've got a much higher ratio of nurses to patients. Mm. And that for, for various reasons, the German health system has always relied on having an extremely large number of nurses. And so I was reading an article yesterday, I can't remember if it was in The Guardian or which newspaper, but one of the theories is that there's a lot of palliative care going on with nurses helping patients, not doing critical stuff, but helping them just navigate feeling very ill mm -hmm. and that stopping the illness sort of getting more serious. Look, I, again, I'm not a doctor. I don't know that. Um, but I, I do know it's something that public health experts are looking at very actively because, you know, there must be lessons there somewhere for what Germany's doing right. Well, it's really wonderful to have your uh, depth of knowledge here with us uh, today as a freelance journal journalist and a professor of journalism at UC Davis. Can you talk to us about the current, I'm switching topics here on you, but the current moment in journalism, people seem to not know where to go. You can't go to the president for accurate information. Um, people. Uh, you know, I've got relatives posting all kinds of insane, they're Fox News relatives, but they're posting way more insane than Fox News theories on their Facebook page. There's this moment in journalism where you just, you know, can you talk about what you're seeing that is happening around, you know, what I've been, I've heard called an infodemic. Yeah, I, well, the infodemic word, I, I like that word and I've heard it too. Um, I think a few things are happening. The first is that already struggling newspapers, this could be the death knell. And we've seen that with a number of alternative weeklies in particular. I live in Sacramento. The Sacramento News and Review last week suspended publication because they ran out of ad revenue. So you're certainly seeing that already stressed publications are straw. They're losing ad revenue. They aren't getting their subscribers anymore. And so it's closing down a lot of news sources. But the second thing, this issue of sort of viral misinformation that's spreading on social media you know it's a huge problem because people are taking medications they shouldn't take they're listening to people spouting nonsense about what medication works what medication doesn't work they're doing stuff that's actually very counterproductive um you know I, the, the only sort of thing i'd say about this is there's nothing new it, it, Throughout human history, whenever you have epidemics, you have misinformation. We just do it more effectively today because social media can spread that misinformation at you know, warp speed. But I have a book by a writer from Elizabethan London 400 years ago, a man called John Stowe. And Stowe was a diarist and he lived through some of the plague years in London. And he wrote about the massive amounts of rumor and misinformation and prayer, you know, the way people responded to the plague um, was really no different than the way a lot of people are responding today. They, they responded 400 years ago by flocking to hear faith healers in churches because they were desperate. They responded to rumor because rumor what was, was the information that was circulating. And they responded to sort of mythology and conspiracy. So they did it in their way 400 years ago in London, and we're doing it in our way, sitting at our computers, typing into Facebook or Twitter in our way in 21st century America today. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think there's an easy answer around that, because I think when people are scared, they do 
look for easy solutions. And there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there who will peddle mythology or peddle misinformation. Our president, for example. Exactly. You know, <laughs> okay. it's a shocking thing. You, you turn on the news, you listen to Trump talking, and you realize you have to at first take a bath because it just makes you feel dirty. But yes. second of all, you actually have to be a public health person and check what's really happening because you're getting lies from the president. It's terrible. It's just horrendous. And I have found watching um, Vice President Mike Pence to be out equally as horrendous as, as watching Donald Trump. Um, yikes. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Sasha Abramsky, you can follow him at Abramsky Sasha on Twitter. Uh, we hope you'll come back and join us again. Your work has been very important to the progressive movement. So thanks. It's it's really a pleasure to have you I here. I love to it. I got nothing but time at the moment. Yeah, I know. I'm like, why? We can really get the good guests now. They're all sitting at home. <laughs> exactly. All right. I'll see Thank you. Thank you soon. so much. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.